세계 경제를 이끄는 경제대국 미국. 하지만 아메리칸 드림은 사라지고 부와 삶의 격차가 갈수록 벌어지고 있죠. 바로 그곳에서 불평등을 연구하는 세계적인 석학들을 만났습니다. 위대한 수업 불평등 특집의 마지막 강사를 소개합니다. 라즈 체티. 그는 빅데이터를 기반으로 빈곤과 불평등을 실증적으로 분석하는 경제학자죠. And my hope is through this type of analysis, we'll be able to extend those opportunities to many kids in the United States, India, and countries around the world. 라즈 체티는 묻습니다. 불평등을 자본주의의 한계로 남겨둘지 아니면 극복해낼 것인지. 그건 그의 강의를 만날 여러분의 몫입니다. Hello, EBS viewers. Welcome to We Day Han Su Up Great Minds. I'm Rod Chetty, William Ackman Professor of Economics at Harvard University and the Director of Opportunity Insights, a center at Harvard that focuses on studying the science of economic opportunity. I'm going to talk today about how we can make changes in our local communities and our local institutions to give children of all backgrounds better chances of rising up. But I want to start at a much bigger picture level by talking about the concept of the American dream, which is a multifaceted, complex concept that means different things to different people, but I think is a central aspect of the American identity and something that people around the world aspire to. The idea that any child should have the chance of moving up in the income distribution and achieving a better standard of living than their parents did. The way I like to think about it visually is by analogy to uh, achieving the American dream being like climbing a ladder for white Americans, where you kind of start off in the next generation, where the previous generation left off. Whereas for black Americans, it's more like being on a treadmill, where even after you've made the climb in one generation, you face these tremendous structural forces that are pushing you back down, only to have to make the climb again. And unless we fix that treadmill, and help groups like black Americans and other uh, disadvantaged groups in other societies, help them uh, maintain the gains they've already achieved, you're gonna have a perpetuation of racial disparities across generations because people are just gonna fall back down even after you've helped them rise up. Okay, so we've talked now about some broad factors that might play into differences in economic opportunity. We found that differences in jobs don't seem to be the key factor in a particular area. We've seen that racial disparities, differences across different types of subgroups uh, can be quite important. I wanna now come back to the map and talk about the next step in our analysis, which tries to get a finer sense of what is driving these geographic differences in rates of upward mobility. The first is that where you grow up really matters. It's not just that the kids who live in one neighborhood versus another neighborhood, or in Salt Lake City versus Charlotte, North Carolina are different from each other. Apparently, if you take a given child and move that child to a different neighborhood just a few miles away, uh, you can get dramatic changes in that child's life outcomes. I see that as a very encouraging result for the US and for any other country around the world because it shows that the solution in terms of creating more economic mobility out of poverty doesn't require us to look at a different time period or at a completely different environment? No, often the answer is just a couple of miles down the street. Second, what you can see here is that what really matters for kids' outcomes is not where they're living as adults, but where they're living as kids. The real key seems to be childhood environment rather than where you're living as an adult. And the third key thing you see is that there's a dosage effect here. Every extra year that you spend living in one of these higher opportunity neighborhoods, one of the blue-green colored places on the map, the better you do in the long run. If you move to such a place when you're five instead of 10 or 10 instead of 15, each extra year that you spend there improves your outcomes in the long run. In particular, there are many places in the US where you have single family zoning, meaning the only kind of house that you can build in that neighborhood is a single family home, often with a yard of a certain size that basically prevents very dense development. 
Now that can be attractive for various reasons, but one thing it does is often excludes people, particularly from lower income families, from building houses or renting houses uh, that are smaller in better school districts, in places with access to better social capital, places that have better opportunities for upward mobility. One thing a number of cities did in recent years to address this type of problem is to create multifamily zoning restrictions or uh, regulations in places that previously were zoned for single family houses. What I wanna do is end by talking about a final perspective on rates of, on, on reasons to increase economic opportunity, which is to focus on the social benefits of increasing rates of upward mobility beyond the people who are uh, directly benefited by these programs. And so to do that, I'm gonna to turn to a very different analysis where we're gonna uh, use data on inventors. We've done a study where we link the universe of patent records for everyone who holds a patent in the United States to data from tax records on their parents' incomes and where they grew up and so on. And we use these data to study who becomes an inventor in America. And the logic here is to show that improving equality of opportunity, the topic we've been focused on, is important not just from the perspective of fairness and justice, giving everyone a shot at the American dream at rising up no matter what their background, but can also be very important for economic growth. So many people think the key driver of economic growth and so, you know, why is it that we have these big gaps in rates of innovation uh, by race, by gender, by income? Why are there so many kids not coming through the innovation pipeline? I just want to show one piece of data that really, uh, I think, shows very clearly the importance of environment and exposure, which is an analysis where we look at how children's chances of becoming inventors vary based on whether they're exposed to inventors in the area in which they're growing up. And what you can see in this first pair of bars is if a child, if a boy grows up in an area with many male inventors, they are much more likely to become an inventor themselves. But if they grew up in an area with many female inventors, that has very little effect on their probability of becoming an inventor. But conversely, if you do the same thing for girls, if girls grow up in an area with more male inventors, it has no impact at all. If they grow up in an area with more female inventors in the prior generation, if they're exposed to more female inventors, they are more likely to go on to become inventors themselves. And so this result, which echoes earlier findings that we've discussed, that exposure and connections and who you're uh, you know, shaped by really influences the pathways you choose to pursue, you know, that's the core reason that uh, we have these gender gaps in innovation, these racial gaps in innovation, these income gaps in innovation, I think underscores the importance of creating the relevant kind of exposure to solve this problem going forward. What is the punchline here? Why is this so important? In this study, we estimate that if women, minorities, and kids from low-income families were to invent at the same rate as kids from high-income white backgrounds, the innovation rate in America would quadruple. We would have four times as many inventors in America as we currently do. And so in that sense, there are an enormous number of lost Einsteins in the United States and likely around the world where we have talented kids who could go on to discover important new drugs or invent new technologies that will change all of our lives, but they're not coming through the pipeline because they haven't been given the opportunities and the exposure that will lead them to pursue careers in innovation. And that problem of lost Einsteins is of course of great relevance to all of us not just to the kids who would themselves have higher chances of upward mobility. And so that underscores why the set of issues we've talked about in these lectures is of central importance for economic growth in general, not just for those interested in inequality. 
I think we've seen that local childhood environment plays a really central role in shaping prospects for upward mobility. That's the level at which we need to be thinking about how to change the dynamics of inequality and opportunity in the next generation, as well as economic growth. Most of the policy debate in many countries focuses on financial issues. How much do we spend on this program or that program? Or what resources do we allocate to this school or that school? Those are no doubt important questions to address. But what we're seeing in time and time again in many different dom domains is that we need to couple that discussion of financial capital with a discussion about social capital, and in particular, think in smart ways about how we provide social support, connections, and exposure in all of our programs to make them more effective, be it housing vouchers, uh, job training, college education, you know, across the spectrum.